Amen. God is greater. Well, hey, um, Fifty Shades of Day, you know what? I, honestly, this, uh, this series, um, I, it's not mine. It's, uh, it's originated by a pastor by the name of Ed Young, um, and he pastors a, a fairly large church in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, but myself and my wife, uh, last year for a conference, we went down to their conference called C3, and, and he preached one of these messages in that series um, at the conference. And honestly, right away, the second I heard it, I thought, I can't wait to bring this to our church. You know, it, pretty much every January, the beginning of the year, we usually do a series on um, relationships and on, like, you know, community and, you know, and how to deal with community. Who, who like, members, maybe last year, we did a series called How to Hug a Vampire. You know, and some of you that are, like, maybe new to this church are like, what kind of church is this? You know, but it was just a, it was a series on, on how to deal with people who suck the life out of you. And the whole premise was, was again, just teaching and, and helping us to walk in community together. Because, you know, realistically in church, you get training on all sorts of stuff. You know, you get training on, on how to forgive. And, you know, you, you'll, if, you, if you attend this church, you'll kind of understand. So it's a huge bent of mine, you know, and, and you'll see it in pretty much every series we do is on, on loving one another. You know, it was like this, this prominent message of Jesus that he brought. And, 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 and we, so we, we teach on that. We teach on how to love one another. And, and community is, is really no excuse. And so, you know, this series, Fifty Shades of They, um, you know, it's actually inspired by Ed Young. He, he wrote this book called Fifty Shades of Day. And, uh, and we can purchase some if you guys, if you want to take one home and, and, and read it. Um, but we don't have any right yet. But you can go and you can buy them on right on Amazon.com if you so choose to desire. But it's a, it's a powerful message series that it's my prayer that, you know, and, it, and it's really neat because we do this at the beginning of the year when we all make resolutions, you know, like how many of you, I can't see your hands, so don't worry. But, you know, are, are like hitting the gym this week, you know, because it's like, yo, I'm, I'm starting that, I'm doing that. No, I don't, can we get a little bit of house lights so I can like see the, 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 the shame on the people when they don't raise their hand? Um, but, but realistically, like, you know, New Year's, Eve, like New Year's, it's like the time when we like, we, we set forward, you, you just heard me preach about it, you know, behold, I'm doing something new, you know, and realistically, that's every day, every day we need to be walking as, as if like, hey, it's in the past, behold, I'm doing something new. Right? But I, I really think it's imperative that we teach on how to relate with one another. Because again, it's so foundational to the message of Christ where he said, by, by this, by how you love one another, by this, people will know that you're my disciples. And so it's not just teaching about, like, forgiveness. It's not just teaching about how to have joy. It's not just, you know, teaching on how to pray. It's, it, we got to teach. we got to learn. we got to, like, soak this up in how to deal with one another and how to surround ourselves with the right they. Because every one of us has a they. You have a they. I have a they. You know, some of us have multiple they's, and that's okay. Um, I'm not saying you're crazy or anything like that, but... You know, every one of us has a they that's around us, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Like, the people, when, 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 when people ask you, like, what the heck were you thinking? Why would you do that? The first thing out of your mouth is, well, they, they said it was a good idea, right? Or I had these friends that thought that this was a wise thing to do. Or, you know, you just have these friends that are around you. And it's not always negative. Like, you know, hear me out. This whole message isn't about, like, like you got to, like, fire all your friends. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about surrounding yourselves with the right they. Surrounding yourselves with people who push you in the right direction. Because every one of us has a they. You have a they. I have a they. My, 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 my mom has a they. She's here. And so I already said that, so it's kind of redundant, but I was just trying to add people. But, you know, we all have a they. We all have people around us. And so the question is, is, is who are they? You know, because the they in our lives have a certain sway when it comes to the way, <laughs> this is good stuff, I know, that we're going. They, they have a sway, and you know this as well as I do. I, I, would, I, would, I would venture to say, and this might be a, a bit of a bold statement, but, but the majority of like your mistakes or the majority of even your victories, the majority of your decisions usually have to do with some form of relationship 
in your life. Those who are married will be like, every relationship or every decision is based on my relationship with my wife, right? Or those kids are like, every decision I'm ever allowed to make depends on what my parents say. So, you know, realistically, that's not a very bold statement to say, but, but the they in our lives, the they in your lives have a power over your life like you probably don't even know. I mean, when you think of your decisions, when you think of like, you know, like, like, like direction that you want to go, a lot of times it's very contingent on what are they going to think? What are they going to say? Which way is the sway of your they? Yeah, I know. This is deep. <laughs> deep, deep, deep. Because this is, this is my thing, and this is, I'll tell you the takeaway already, is I want you to know that you have the right to choose the they in your life. You have the right to choose the they in your life. That's why I can say, maybe, I said it already, maybe you do need to think about firing some friends. Because of the sway of that they is contrary to your way. Proverbs 27 simply says this. It says, a mirror reflects a man's face. This is Solomon speaking. And you know what? This verse, you know, it's funny because we look to the Bible for gold, right? We look to the Bible and just say like, God, give me revelation today. Give me something, you know, good. Give me some gold this morning. And so the gold that we see is a mirror reflects a man's face. And you all are like... That's not even bronze. That's like pretty much known to all men that when I put a mirror in front of my face, I actually see a really good physical representation of what I look like. And, and this is great. This is a little freebie for you this morning. I guarantee that every single one of you, when you look in the mirror, you see the Bible. Some of you are like, how do I do that? Well, there's a verse in the Bible that says, we are all subject to the bondage of decay. If you're wondering what that is, Put a mirror in front of your face and say, I don't look like I used to, or I don't look like what I, right now, what I used to 20 years ago. Because we're subject to the bondage of decay. And so, but, but this is what I'm saying, is a mirror reflects a man's face. So when you look in a mirror, you can see who you are. You can see that accurate physical representation of your hair, maybe less hair on some of us. You can see maybe, you know, again, that bondage of decay, but you can get an accurate picture of who you are. But Solomon, this is the guy writing this, he goes and he says, okay, a mirror reflects a man's face, but if you want to know what he is really like, it's shown by the kinds of friends he chooses. This is what Solomon is saying. It's like, yeah, you can, you can look in a mirror. You can find out what they look like. But this is what I'm telling you. If you want to know what they're really like, if you want to know what that person is really like on the inside, it's easy. All you got to do is look at his friends. You know, it's a statement that, you know, maybe we hear in church or, you know, you know like, or from the Bible, you know, like, show me your friends. I think it was actually in, in, in one of these Fifty Shades of They videos. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. But I think, actually, and this is what Ed Young says, he says, I think, actually, you can go and you can say, show me your friends and I'll show you your past, your present, and your future. Because this is here, this, this is big. Parents, parents, if you have kids, okay, I, I'd be willing to bet that I would be able to identify your, your, your children's friends in 10 years, in 15 years, by, get this, by the type of friends that you have. How many, we know, all of our, we, anyone that's a parent, we know that our kids imitate us. Our kids try to be like us. Our kids do, I, man, we, we just went shopping, and, I, and somebody pointed this out to me this morning. I bought my son a pair of pants. You know, and a pair of pants, and if you come here, you'll see I wear them sometimes. They're like cuffed at the bottom. You know, I'm sure I might get mocked about that, but you wait, you wait. Two more months, Beaver's going to be wearing them all the time. They're going to be in style. And y'all are going to be like, I want a pair. But hey, this is my son. We go buy them this pair of pants, and he immediately puts them on. He's like, Daddy, I got pants like you. He starts walking around the house. Daddy, I'm like you. Right? Because our kids, they want to imitate us. Our kids, they want. And this isn't here. This is not limited to just when you have little kids. My dad's here. I'm going to gloat on him. I love that he reads his Bible. I want to be like that. 
I want to imitate my dad's devotion to reading the Bible as much as he does. So it's not just because, it's not just little kids. So if you're like an adult here and you got kids that are grown up, you might even have grandkids. Let me tell you, your kids are still watching. And your kids will choose their friends based on who you have chosen your friends in your life. A mirror reflects a man's face. But if you want to know what he's really like, it's shown by the kinds of friends that he chooses. And now hear me out. I'm not talking about friends because there's two different types of friends that we need to maybe lay the foundation for this whole series. Because us as Christians, us as believers, we're not called to just have Christian friends. We're called to what? To be salt and light to the earth. We're called to go out and to love people. We're called to go out and be Jesus to people. And so there's the, those people. But I'm talking more about the people that the, the Bible would describe as those that we have fellowship with. The close friends, like your posse, the ones that would speak into your life, the ones that you would go to when you have a victory, the ones that you would go to when you're struggling with something, the ones that have your respect enough that you would be willing to hear what it is they have to say in your life. Because your friends have a sway that alters your way. The close friends, the ones that you would say, that my, that's, that's my posse. Ed Young goes and describes a friend, and this is the friend that, that's, that Solomon is talking about. It's the friends, like the, the, the friends. Because, again, they're, like, if you're wondering, okay, what's the difference between like, like a, a fellowship-type friend and like friends that I might have coffee with every now and then, friends that I'm like, you know, trying to like, love on, trying to you know, show the love of Jesus to, What's the difference? Or, or, or even like, okay, am I allowed to have friends that do this? Am I allowed to? Here's, here's a real good, easy way. How many of you have smartphones? You can take out your smartphone in church right now. I'll give you full permission. In fact, I'll be honest with you, this, this sermon this morning, it's very noteworthy. There's going to be a lot of content that I'm going to throw on here, and I know for a fact that none of you are going to be able to remember it. I'm going to have to preach from my notes because I don't even remember all the points. All right, so this is a very good sermon for you to pull out your notepad, pull out your smartphone, take some notes. But here, let me just go real quick. If you're wondering what type of friend I'm talking about, open up your Facebook app and click on your friends list and count every one person out of four that's a real friend. 75% of the friends you have on Facebook are like, you know, friends in the fray. You know, you, like, you don't really, you know, like, you would unfriend them and you'd be fine with that. In fact, some of you are already thinking, like, I need to unfriend this person because all they ever do is talk about doing this and doing that. And, and it's just so offensive and all they, you know, like, there's those type of friends that you have in your life. You know, Facebook friends. But there's friends in your life that are foundational. And this is what Ed Young says. He says, friends is simply this. It's foundational relationship. Listen to this. In everyone's natural domain. Foundational relationship in everyone's natural domain. The ones that are close. The ones, again, that have that sway. The ones, again, that you would go to. The ones, again, that you would trust. The ones, again, that are like, like your comrades. The ones that are your like, like shopping mates. What's the girl version of comrade? I don't even know. Right? Like the ones that are close. That's what, that's, what, that's what Pastor Ed is talking about in the series. It's the foundational relationships in everyone's natural domain. Because here's the thing. In this whole series, you're going to find that there is like a flow that when it comes to your friends. When it comes to like close friends. There's like a, a, a grid, if, as a, if, you, if you will. You know, that, that when it comes to your friends, that, that this is a very good way to kind of like look at your friends and, and process them through this this grid, in a sense. And it's simply this. It's your affiliation. Like, who are you affiliated with? Who would you go and say, yeah, that, that person fits into this description of my they. That person fits into this description of my friend. They're foundational. They're not just somebody that's on the outside that I might see, like, you know, at Christmas or, you know, at Easter or, you know, <laughs> whenever you see your family. I'm talking about, like, like foundational relationships. They, who's your affiliation? Who do you run with? Who do you walk with? Who do you talk with on a, on a daily or weekly basis? And then affiliation, the next thing is what's their participation? 
So right now, when you think of, like, who am I affiliated with? Who am I tight with? Who am I, like, like this with? That's me over here, right? Who am I, who am I with? What's, what's my affiliation? And then what's, the, what's their participation? Because, hear me, what your affiliation is determines what your participation is. Regardless if it be something that you say, well, that's my participation or not, I'm just being real, I'm being honest, that who you hang out with, again, show me friends and I'll show you your future. What's your affiliation determines what your participation is, and then ultimately, this is the, this is the end, it's what's the destination of that participation based on my affiliation. Because here, if you, if you run with the crowd... This is what Ed says. He says, the crowd will run you. If you run with the crowd, the crowd will run, run you. Here's a couple biblical examples of some people in the Bible that had the right they and the wrong they. The first one, ironically enough, it's the verse that we just read uh, in Proverbs. There. It was written by the guy named Solomon. And Solomon, you know, you've heard me preach on him numerous times. He was the, the, the wisest man. He was also Solomon. I talked about this Christmas Eve. He was Solomon the rich. He had more money then you knew what to deal with. He had more, like, wives and concubines than, like, like he had, honestly, people, like, you either married, like, even newlyweds, maybe. You might think that you're, like, having lots of sex. But Solomon would put you to shame. Like, he had 900 wives and concubines. Like, in my mind, I'm even, th- like, how does that even work? It just doesn't, it doesn't compute. But here's this guy, you know, that we look to because he wrote all of Proverbs. He wrote all of, like, Song of Solomon's and Ecclesiastes. And he was like a fountain of knowledge when it came to wisdom. He was a fountain of knowledge when it came to little one-liners that, you know, would just, like, change the course of direction. It was, we did a whole series, Ask It, on one verse that Solomon wrote. So this guy is this great, awesome, grand guy. But let me tell you, he, you know, there's another thing in the church where we talk about this. It's called finishing strong. You know, it doesn't matter. Like, like think of how you run a race, you know. It doesn't matter if you get, the, like, the best start. If you don't finish well, the race doesn't end well. You know, or, or I mean, air hockey, right? I mean, you could win your first game in the, le- in the season, but if you lose the next, whatever it is, 81 games, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how well you played at the beginning. It doesn't matter what type of start you had. If you didn't finish well, you didn't finish well. And that, my friends, is the case with Solomon. He went and lived this lavish life. He went and lived this life where, honestly, people would send their, their like kings would send their people to him to say, Solomon, we need your wisdom. What would you do with this? How would you accomplish this? How would you process? How would you deal with these type of people that I got in my country? And they would send people to him, and Solomon would just be this, this fountain of wisdom. He'd just like barf wisdom on them all the time. And so Solomon, he goes and he writes in, in Ecclesiastes at the end of his life, and he just said, listen to this. He says, it was all vanity. It was, it was chasing my tail. It was chasing the wind. It was, it was pointless because he surrounded himself with the wrong they. God was at the, the same time saying, Solomon, don't go solo. Solomon, don't go alone. Solomon, like, surround yourselves with the right they. Solomon, surround yourselves with the right people. But as I already said, Solomon, he chased women. Like I see, he had 900 wives and concubines. He would chase. He was a lover of women, and, and he was a lover, get this, of foreign women. It wasn't the women in his kingdom, his people, they weren't even good enough. He had to go and chase these foreign women. And, and God said, Solomon, do not, do not surround yourselves with those they, if that even makes sense. But Solomon chose to surround himself, not just with the women, but with all the people that came with all those women. And if you're married, you know what I'm talking about? In-laws. He chose to surround himself with the wrong they. And so at the end of his life, we think like, man, Solomon, he was so rich. He built the temple. The temple is still called Solomon's temple. The guy was legit. But if you ask him, he would say it was all vanity. It was all chasing the wind because he chose to surround himself with the wrong they. And he ended poorly. And he finished crappy. 
because he's surrounded himself with the wrong they. See, we need to learn from him and look at like, okay, Solomon had the affiliation with the wrong they. And they participated in sacrifices to, you know, foreign gods and doing all these like crazy things. And that was their participation. What was their destination? It was a bad ending. And so we need to learn from that. Again, like us as parents, man. We need to catch this because we need to understand like, hey, we, parents, let me just be real clear, okay? I know some of you are like, I want to let my kids make their own decisions. I want them to learn. No, man, that's stupid. You tell your kids who their friends are. Because their affiliation determines their participation, which ultimately determines their destination. And you're like, well, my, my kid's 16. What? No, honestly, what? I just want to let them play with rattlesnakes. Let them learn on their own, make their own decisions. Now, again, you see how stupid that is? So you, you get in your kids' lives. If they're, on, if they're on social media, you get in there like swimwear. You figure out, like, what are they doing? You figure out who their friends are. You figure out who their they is. You figure out what their participation is. Because you're wise. As a parent, you know that that participation, based on that affiliation, leads to an untimely destination. And so, parents, this is me as a pastor giving you full permission. You get into your kids' lives. You help them figure out the right they. And you help them fire the wrong they. Even if it means grounding them. Some of the teens in here are like, what? No way. Well, you, you'll have kids someday, all right? So you just remember this message. When you have kids, you'll be like, I now agree with that pastor. I didn't then. I wanted to shoot them. It's a good thing we're not in Texas. Did you guys hear that? They're allowed to pack a gun on your hip in Texas now. I just read that on the news. That's scary. I mean, before it wasn't really any better. You had to hide it. But now everyone knows you're packing. So anyhow, I'm glad that's not the case here. So I would have caught a cap. Yeah, that was gold. It just came to me just now. All right, back on track. Amy, let me get back on track. Solomon, again, surrounded himself with the wrong they, ended up at the wrong destination. But now we look to somebody that surrounded himself with the right they, and we look at his affiliation, participation, and his destination. Is a guy by the name of Daniel. And Daniel, if you grew up in church, if you know you were in kids' church or whatever, even if you even if you didn't, you might know Daniel just based on the, the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And Daniel, you know, here he is in this foreign country, ironically the same word that you know kind of got Solomon all messed up, foreign country with all these foreign problems, all these foreign women around. And Daniel still chose to surround himself with the right they, and you know what, we would know those guys as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, the guys that went into the furnace, and with Jesus came out, you know, and, but here's the thing, Daniel went through a lot of problems, Daniel went through snares, Daniel had to go through trials and tribulations, but through it all, he chose to say, no, I'm keeping the right they in my life. I'm choosing, I'm making the decision to, to keep my, my faithful firemen, if you want to call them that, around me because I know that my affiliation with them will lead me to participate in the right things. And you can go and read about this in the Old Testament, the story of Daniel. I think it's like 2 Kings or something like that. But you can read all about Daniel in the lion's den. You can read all about Daniel and, and Shadrach, sorry, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All these guys that chose to participate in the right things by not bowing down to false gods, by, by choosing to make it a priority in their life to worship the one true God. And by that participation... It, it resulted in Daniel, not only, now some of you are thinking that was the end for Daniel. He went to the lion's den, you know, and we didn't really hear. But he became, he became, his destination was one of the prominent leaders of his people because he chose to surround himself with the right they. He chose to make it a priority to say that this is going to be my they. Now, I want to give you guys, and this is why I was saying take notes, because I want to give you guys kind of like, like six quick things, quick questions, because I think that every single one of us in here 
can do something when it comes to our they, our friends, our posse, our comrades, the close, the foundational relationships in everyone's natural domain. I think that we can do a thing called a friend inventory. Does that make sense? You know how, like, you know, you take an inventory of, like, all the... Who has way too many toys in their house now after Christmas? Come on, every parent should be like, yeah. Yeah, my in-laws gave my two daughters a... I think it's like a, a five-foot dollhouse. It's like that... It's huge. Shai spent, like, two hours last night cussing at this thing. She was the one building. I was working on my message. No, I'm just joking. She doesn't swear on Saturdays, but uh, <clears throat> she built this thing, and honestly, we have so many toys that I'm like, man, honey, we need to take an inventory of the toys that we have in our house, and we need to, like, do a garage sale of all garage sales, and just purge, and just, like, get rid of some crap. I mean, honestly, we have so many toys. The kids got so many toys that I'm thinking, we, we, need, we just need to start getting rid of furniture. It's not a matter of getting rid of toys. It's like, Guys, we have no couch because your dollhouse is there. Now, there's a couch in the dollhouse, so go ahead and pretend to use that. But we need to take inventory of our friends. We need to take a friend inventory of our friends. And I want to bring to you guys kind of six quick things because there's certain friends, there's certain they in your life that you need to fire. There's certain they in your life that you need to, like, maybe demote, you know, from fellowship to, like, acquaintance from like friend to casual from like talk every week to I'll see you Christmas because let me just be real quick there's three types of they in your life everyone's life you have three types of they you have fray they you know I already mentioned that those are kind of like the friends on the outside the friends that you kind of like they pop up for a bit and you see them for you know you reunite talk yeah this is so great and then you always end that conversation with something like this. Hey, we should keep in touch more. You all know what I'm talking about. Hey, we should hang out. Right? And then, well, when do you want to do that? Yeah, call me. Right? We have these fray they. Jesus had fray they. He had people always around him, coming around and following him. And then he would say something. And they would be like, nope, that's too hard. I'm out of here. Right? He would have fray they. These ones that are just kind of like, they pop up, they're there, and then they're gone. Every single one of us has fray and, and every single one of us has cray they, crazy people, you know? And like, like some of you are like right now, well, I don't really, I can't think of any cra crazy, like cray they. Don't put your hand up, but just think your family. <laughs> right? Just think your family. Like every single one of us has, like they're the ones that like blow up your cell phone, you know, texting and, you know, they write you something and then, you don't respond in six seconds, and they're like, hey, I know you read it. What's going on? And then you don't respond to that, and they're like, hey, consider us unfriended. And then you get the Facebook notification that you got deleted off their Facebook. You know, like, like these are the cray they, the ones that, like, are all up in your face all the time. And, and this, here's, here's a real good uh, indicator of somebody that's like a cray they. It's like, no matter what you're talking about, they always seem to turn it back to what they're passionate about. I, I can only think of, you know, and forgive me if you're in car sales, you know, or in, like insurance sales. But if you're in sales, of any, let me just say it like that. If you're in sales, I, I sometimes think that I'm kind of a cray-they in people's lives, right? Because I'm so, I'm so madly in love with Jesus, and I know that he changed my life, and I know that he changed my friend's life, and I know that he would change that person's life. That it's somewhat of, I, I'll be blunt with you, it's somewhat of a hidden agenda with me. I just, I want people to know and understand the love of Jesus and how much he can change your life for the better. And this is what I'm saying with like, you know, salespeople. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. They're, they're like the crazy that always seems to turn it back. You, they don't even have to be talking about cars. You could be talking about like Barbie houses. And they'd be like, Barb, did it come with a car? Because I know what kind of car that you would need. Right? They're the cray they. They're the ones that are all up in your face about everything. So there's fray they, there's cray they, and then there is the way they. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus was the way. He was the ultimate way they for anybody's life. And there's people in your life that will push you in the right direction. There's people in your life, there's the they in your life that are so focused on the way in their life that they motivate you to walk in the way that you should be going. Now, let me be clear, okay? When it comes to bad day in your life, 
it's not necessarily that they always pull you in the wrong direction. Sometimes they do, but let me be clear, sometimes they don't. Because let me, like, this is, the, the wrong they won't always pull you the wrong way, but they'll always get in the way of you going in the right way. So Jesus, he had, he had cray they. Do this. He had fray they, the people that would be like, Wah. and he had way they. He had his disciples. He had his posse. He had his people that he chose to surround himself with. And I think it's based on these six questions that are pulled straight from the Bible. And so if you're taking notes, the first one, when it comes to taking a friend in Tory, I want you to ask the question is, do they motivate me to love God more? You know, as a former youth pastor and, 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 and a director out at a, at a kid's camp where we hired like 100 young adult staff every single year, I have, I have said this over a dozen times. Because every single time somebody comes to me and says, hey, what do you think, what do you think about, you know, me dating her? What do you think about my relationship with him? What do you think about, you know, us maybe, maybe, you know, if you think it'd be cool, what do you think about us, like, maybe getting together and going on a date? And I remember I used to say this countless times. I say, hey, you know what, check it out. Try it out. See what they're like. But you have to ask yourself this question. Do they push you towards God? Because the right they will always motivate you to love God more. The right they will always push you in the direction that God wants you to go. Hebrews 3.13 says, But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. We need to surround ourselves with people that push us, that encourage us, that challenge us to love God more. Nobody wants to be around, I'm sorry if your name is Debbie, but a Debbie Downer. You know, that always is, again, like just turn a conversation. Oh, woe is me. You know... I've got, yeah, no, that's, that's great. You love Jesus. You know, he forgot about me. Right? Nobody wants to be around that type of person. We need to surround ourselves with people that encourage us daily. And then, and then daily, as if that's not clear enough, right? Paul has to go and write, as long as it's called today. Just if you weren't clear on what daily meant. Encourage one another daily. We need to surround ourselves with people that push us towards God and not pushing you away. Number two is do they celebrate God's blessing in my life? And Debbie Downer, sorry, she kind of comes up in this one as well. But, you know, like honestly, if, if you're they, if your friends that you would consider your close posse, that you would consider like these are the ones around me, I love and I support, and they support me. But if you can't go to them and share the blessing that's in your life that God has given you without you being worried that they're going to be offended, without you being worried that they're going to turn it back on them, without you being worried that they're just going to be like, oh, good, yeah, you got a new truck. Yeah, it must be nice to have the cushy job. If they can't celebrate the blessing that God has put in your life and on your life with you, man, you need to fire them. The Bible says, the Bible says in Proverbs, listen to this. It says, the whole city celebrates when the godly succeed. Man, I want to be, I want to be around the they like that. People, I just be real with you now, you know, like as as a pastor, you know, we, we see lots of victories, you know, we see lots of like awesome stuff. You know, case in point, last Christmas Eve. Did that huge Christmas Eve service. The team spent so much time rehearsing. Becky spent so much time with all those awesome kids, you know, that just like love to dance and, and nothing else. You know, and like listening is one of those things they don't love doing. But, you know, she spent so much time, Shy spent so much time rehearsing that song and getting it right and timing with the lights, like Gabby and, and Beth back there and the whole team back there. They spent so much time. You know, rehearsing and doing all that stuff. And Desiree memorized, were you guys here? She memorized that entire poem. I mean, it's sometimes easy to memorize a song because the tune kind of carries you. And you can just kind of throw in the odd watermelon if you don't know the lyric. But like on a poem, come on. That is hard. 
We need to celebrate with those people. We need to, we need to say, man, good job. We need to say, man, you, Becky, you have such incredible talent, not only with dancing, but with, like, patience and stuff. Right? We need to be celebrating with those people. And, and you know what? <clears throat> this is, you know what? We do that big service to get people comfortable with church. And so, me as the pastor, I'm just like, man, I, again, you, you guys are here. I just want people to love Jesus. I want people to know Jesus. I want people to fall in love with Jesus. I want people to see how life-changing and how great he is. And how even in the dark times when you know that you have that person that is carefully watching you and, and has plans for you to succeed, to give you hope in a future. So, I mean, my whole thing is I just want people, I want people to make a decision for Christ. I want people to say, you know what, that's me. I am far from God. And so, I, I, you know what, no hands went up Christmas Eve. But lo and behold, in the giving box at the end of the service, we go look in it, and there's a card from a lady that says, I choose Jesus tonight. We need to celebrate that. That is the blessing of God on our church, to give the gospel away amidst a, a, a church service where the only reason people come is because their family says, hey, we're going to Christmas Eve service, and then we're going to eat appetizer, and we're going we're to have a great Christmas. So help me God, we are going to have a great Christmas. So we are going to Christmas Eve service. But yet that one person that chose to come in here decides that that moment is going to be the moment when she says, I choose Jesus. We need to celebrate that. We need, to, we need to get together and say, yes, God. We, we, don't be all coming in here and saying, yeah, it was all show. All he did was poems and songs and dances. No, we need to celebrate the fact that God blessed that one person. And I believe that there was many more in here that maybe got a taste of church that was maybe a little bit different than what they normally experience. But we need to celebrate. We need to get with them. And so in the same way, the they that you have, if you can't go to them and say, man, God is blessing me. Like, I just got a new promotion. We should be responding. You got a new promotion? That's awesome. You got a raise? Way to go. You, man, that's a long time coming. You deserve that raise. The wrong they are the ones that respond with, oh, you got a raise. Oh, good for you. Yeah, way to go. I don't get raises. I don't have a cushy job like you do. I can't afford all them toys that you all got going up all over there. Fire that friend. Get rid of that they. The right they celebrates what God is doing in your life. Number three is, are they with me? Or sorry, do they have my back? Do they have my back? You know, because when you, when you encounter a problem, when you encounter a trial, when you encounter like some, so even some form of shame, you know, like a, maybe a mess up or something like that, you know, the right they are going to be the ones that are with you. The right they are going to be the ones that say, hey man, it's, don't worry, it's going to get better. The wrong they are all concerned about the reputation that they might have being affiliated with you and your messed up self, and they're the ones running. Case in point, here's David, David, King David, you know, the guy that killed Goliath. He's sitting with his mighty men, and they just encountered this massive wipe, this massive, like, oh, we got annihilated. And so David goes, and he goes to them, and he doesn't respond. He doesn't, like, say, you know, to them, like, hey, you know, like, how's your Bible reading? You know, he doesn't go to them and say, hey, did you worship today? He doesn't go to them and say, hey, you know, like, was your, was your sword sharp? What happened? Did you trip? Did you fall? Like, no, he doesn't go to them. He goes and says this one thing. He says, hey, are you with me? Because he wanted to surround himself with the right they because he knew that the right they are people that have our backs. The people that protect us when we fall. The people that don't point us out when we mess up. I, I have, I'm going to get real personal. I, you know, if, if you know me, if you've been in this church for a while, I, I've shared my testimony of my, 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 my snare that I've had in the past. I've shared my snare of, of sexual immorality, messing around before I got married, and even in a marriage, you know, like, like with, with uh, porn and, you know, on the internet and all this stuff, and I shared it. And so I know that that's a snare. And so one thing I've done, I've surrounded myself with the right they in my life that have my back, that are with me, 
And this leads right into number four. Is do they hold me accountable out of love and friendship? These two are very much linked. Somebody that has your back is also the person that's going to hold you accountable. And now notice it says this, out of love and friendship. And so with my snare, I've surrounded myself with a former pastor, somebody that, you know, if I were to mess up, I know that he's not going to go and put it on Facebook. Yo, message me, hey, hey, Dave, what was that website you were looking at on public Facebook? I know he's not going to do that. He's going to phone me and say, hey, what was going on? with that web search. What were you looking at? Because the right they, they hold you accountable out of love and friendship. Right, again, going back to David. Here's David, this guy that, you know, he's the king of Israel, like the, the second king, the first good king, because Saul was kind of a loony, right? But this guy, you know, this, this great and powerful guy, goes and sees this naked woman bathing on the roof of her house. And he goes and he lies with her, as the Bible says, that's the PG version, okay? He lies with her, and then, you know, he finds out that he got her pregnant, and then he's like, oh man, like she's married, I need to do something about her hubby. And so he gets her hubby killed, right? And he does all this stuff. And then Nathan, this guy, the right they in his life, comes up and he says, and he says, David, David, I want to tell you a story. There was this king, and you know, I don't want to tell the whole story, but he talks about two different people, and, and one has like one little lamb, this beautiful little baby lamb, and one that has like this whole massive herd of like cattle and sheep and goats and chickens and tigers. Just Joe, I threw that one in. But he's got this whole crowd of, you know, like stuff. And then this guest comes and this rich guy says, well, I got to feed, I got to feed my friend, yo. And so what does he do? He goes and takes this tiny little lamb from this other guy and he slaughters it and he feeds his friend. And he tells David this story and David's like, what? I think he spoke King James back then. Thou shalt kill that man. He doth did a baddest thing. And Nathan goes and responds. This is what he says. Hey, David, you are the man. He called him out on what David did wrong. And you know what? This is great because David responded with something so great. You can go and read it. I think it's Psalm, Psalm 51. His repentant prayer for lying with Bathsheba and, and killing her husband and trying to cover it up and doing all this thing because Nathan was the right they. He chose to do it in a way that was for the better for David. He wasn't trying to bring him down. He was trying to bring him up. And that's the right they that we need to have in our lives because every one of us, we put it on our side. No perfect people. Every single one of us got issues. Every single one of us got mess-ups, got hang-ups, got snares. Not one of us is perfect, but we need to have the right they in our life that hold us accountable out of love and friendship. Nathan had an affinity with David. Nathan had the ability to go and speak into David's life and say, y'all screwed up, man. I got to rush through the other ones here. The right they live what they believe. And that's the, 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 the next question there. Do they live what they believe? You all know somebody that just talks the walk but doesn't walk the walk. And I'm not talking about just, you know, being a Jesus follower. I'm talking about people that are just two-faced. I'm talking about people that, you know, like will say one thing to your face and they'll go and say another thing to somebody else because they don't, they don't live what they believe. They don't live that, 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 that that's belief that they need to be the right they. And so you, you we, we, man, as parents... As parents, you know, we get this. We don't want our kids hanging around with the wrong they. We don't want our kids hanging around with people that say one thing and do another. We don't want our, hey, we don't want our kids hanging out with kids of parents who don't walk the walk, who just talk the talk. Right? We've used this verse before, and it says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. The wise walk with the wise. And you notice it says, talk with the wise and become wise. It says, no, it says, walk with the wise and become wise. We need to surround ourselves with people who are so passionately in love with what they talk about that they walk it. 
Number six. This is a big one. Do they have the right they in their lives? Are the right they that you would consider the right they, your friends, your foundational relationships, do, do they have the right they in their lives? Based on, and you can even use this list. I hope, I hope you guys wrote this down. Or at least took a picture of it or something. Because honestly, these questions, it's my goal. This is, this is like what I want to leave you with you today is that you would just simply take an inventory. That you would just simply like use these questions or even use the grid of what's my affiliation, what's their participation, and ultimately what's their destination. Because what their destination is, if you're participating in the same thing, it's your destination. And so it's my hope and prayer that when you look at these, that they have the right they in their lives. That they have the right they in their lives. Ephesians, this is Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 5. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what this whole thing is about, is submitting to one another, is going and finding that right friend, that right they in your life, and just saying, man, I submit what you got for me. I submit to what it is that you have for me. If they're a loner, if your they is a loner, that's the wrong they. If your they, listen, if, you, if your they doesn't surround themselves with people going the same way that your way needs to be, then you need to fire some friends out of reverence for Christ. So in conclusion, looking at this entire list, do they motivate me to love God more? Do they celebrate God's blessing in my life? Do they have my back? Are they with me? Do they hold me accountable out of love and friendship? Do they live what they believe? And do they have the right they in their lives? And again, I, don't, I, I, I fully don't expect you to memorize this. I mean, I've been preparing this message for like three weeks, and I couldn't even memorize this. That's why I'm saying take notes. But let me be clear. You have the right to choose your friends. You have the right to choose the they in your life. And again, if you're a parent, you have the right to choose the they in your kids' lives that are under the age of 18. But I, I, I hope and pray that you walk out of here knowing that you have the right to choose the they in your life. And this is kind of corny, but the right they, and again, because I believe in the Bible, I believe in Jesus, the right they will always have he in the middle of them. See that? T-H-E-Y. The right they. You can almost add it as the seventh or even just like the one thing. The right they will always have he in the middle. And again, I'm not saying that you can't have like non-Christian friends because again, as a church, as Christians, Jesus, what did he say? I came, I, it was not the healthy that needed a doctor, but the sick. I came for the sinners. And so we need to absolutely be reaching out to those that don't have he in the middle of them. But when it comes to the ones that influence you, when it comes to the ones that alter your participation, when it comes to the ones that you really affiliate yourselves with, when it comes to the ones who you have, like the Bible talks about, like fellowship with, the ones that you're with, they need to be the right they. Let me pray.